How China Built the World's Largest Tech Workforce Picture this, you're at a Silicon Valley coffee shop and the conversation at the next table stops you cold. We can't compete with them, one venture capitalist is saying. They have millions of engineers. We have what? Maybe hundreds of thousands. He's talking about China. And he's not wrong. When DeepSeek's AI model sent shockwaves through American tech circles in early 2025, performing as well as GPT-4 at a fraction of the cost, it wasn't just another tech breakthrough. It was the latest reminder of something that's been quietly reshaping global competition for decades. China has built the world's most massive concentration of technical talent, and most Western observers still don't understand how or why. The numbers are staggering. China graduates nearly 40% of its university students in STEM fields, compared to just 19% in the United States. When Donald Trump promised to bring manufacturing back to America, industry insiders quietly pointed out an inconvenient truth. America simply doesn't have enough engineers to run those factories. But here's the puzzle that most Western analyses miss. This wasn't supposed to happen. For over a thousand years, Chinese culture actively discouraged technical learning. So how did a civilization that once dismissed engineering as beneath scholarly dignity become the world's engineer factory? The answer is a story of survival, transformation, and one of the most dramatic cultural reversals in human history. When engineers were nobody. If you traveled to China 150 years ago, you'd encounter a world where knowing how to build things was actually a mark of low social status. The imperial examination system, imagine the SATs, but lasting 1,300 years and testing only poetry and philosophy, created a society where the ability to quote ancient texts mattered infinitely more than the ability to, say, design a bridge. Chinese artisans could build incredible things. They invented gunpowder, printing, and navigation technologies that wouldn't reach Europe for centuries. But socially, they ranked below farmers. Many were trapped in hereditary castes, forbidden from taking the exams that led to government jobs and social respectability. This created what we might call the great irony of Chinese history. The civilization that gave the world so many foundational technologies had structured itself to systematically undervalue technical knowledge. Then the British showed up with gunboats. The humiliation that changed everything. The opium wars of the 1840s were more than military defeats. They were civilizational shock therapy. Imagine you're the smartest kid in class, and suddenly the kid you've always ignored beats you at everything. That's roughly how Chinese intellectuals felt when British industrial technology demolished their military and economic assumptions. The response was immediate and desperate. A scholar named Wei Yuan wrote what became a revolutionary manifesto, learn the superior techniques of the barbarians to control the barbarians. For the first time in Chinese history, someone was arguing that foreign technical knowledge wasn't just useful, it was essential for survival. But old habits die hard. When the government established the Imperial College of Foreign Languages in 1862 and tried to add mathematics and science, traditional scholars revolted. These subjects were strange skills and odd techniques. They argued, parlor tricks unworthy of serious minds. Then came 1895, and everything changed. China's defeat by Japan in the First Sino-Japanese War was psychologically devastating in a way that's hard for Westerners to understand. Japan had been China's cultural student for over a millennium. It was as if Harvard suddenly lost a debate competition to a community college. The message was clear. Copying four machines wasn't enough. China needed to understand the science behind them. The Great Learning Migration what happened next was unprecedented. Starting in the early 1900s, Chinese students began flooding Western universities, but not the way you might expect. While American and European students spread across different fields, Chinese students concentrated overwhelmingly in engineering and science. We're talking about 66% choosing STEM fields, compared to just 22% in humanities. These weren't casual study abroad programs. Students like Qian Xuesen, who would become the father of China's space program, and Deng Jiaxian, who led the atomic bomb project, were making enormous personal and financial sacrifices, driven by something they called science for national salvation. Think about the psychology here. 
These young people believed that mastering calculus and thermodynamics wasn't just about personal career advancement, it was about preventing their country from being carved up by foreign powers. World War II turned this urgency into something approaching desperation. When Japanese forces occupied China's Easter universities, faculty and students loaded laboratory equipment onto carts and fled to southwestern China, where they established makeshift institutions in tin-roofed buildings. Students would literally grab scientific instruments before running to air raid shelters. That level of dedication to technical learning was becoming embedded in Chinese culture in a way that would have been unimaginable a century earlier. The Communist Gamble Engineering Utopia When the communists took power in 1949, they inherited a country where 80% of people couldn't read and industrial production accounted for less than 20% of the economy. Their solution was characteristically bold and systematic, reorganized the entire education system around technical training. The transformation was dramatic. Tsinghua University, previously a liberal arts institution, became primarily an engineering school. By 1957, 56% of all Chinese university students were studying STEM fields, up from 33% just five years earlier. But here's what made the Chinese approach different from, say, Soviet technical education, the social mobility component. In a rigidly hierarchical communist society, becoming an engineer was one of the few reliable paths from rural poverty to urban middle-class status. This created a feedback loop that's still operating today. Parents saw that technical education led to good jobs and social respectability. Students internalized the message that mathematics and science weren't just subjects, they were tickets to a better life. The psychological impact of the two bombs, one satellite, achievements in the 1960s can't be overstated. When China successfully tested nuclear weapons and launched satellites despite international isolation and economic hardship, scientists and engineers became national heroes. A popular slogan emerged, learn mathematics, physics, and chemistry well, and you can go anywhere in the world without fear. An entire generation grew up believing this. When markets met engineering minds, Deng Xiaoping's market reforms after 1978 could have disrupted this STEM focus. After all, suddenly there were opportunities in finance, real estate, and other non-technical fields. Instead, something interesting happened. Many of China's most successful early entrepreneurs turned out to be engineers. Lu Chuanji, who built Lenovo into a global computer giant, had been a researcher at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Zhang Rumin, who transformed Hire into a major appliance manufacturer, started as a factory technician. Ren Jingfei, Huawei's founder, was a former military engineer. This pattern was distinctly different from Silicon Valley, where many successful entrepreneurs came from business or liberal arts backgrounds. In China, technical expertise seemed to be a prerequisite for business success. The restoration of university entrance exams in 1977 intensified the competition. With limited university spots available, students and families made rational calculations. STEM fields offered the best career prospects, so that's where the top students went. The Internet Gold Rush The 1990s brought a new twist to this story. When multinational corporations like IBM, Motorola, and Siemens entered the Chinese market, they offered salaries far above domestic standards, but almost exclusively to STEM graduates. There was a saying in the late 1990s, computer science graduates can afford cars, other majors can only take the bus. By 1995, computer science entrance scores at top universities exceeded those of traditionally prestigious fields like literature and history. Then came the internet boom, and suddenly technical skills weren't just well compensated, they were the path to entrepreneurial wealth. Every major Chinese internet company was founded by engineers. Li Yanhong, the founder of Baidu, information systems graduate. Ma Huateng, the founder of Tencent, computer science graduate. Ding Lei, the founder of NetEase, communications engineering graduate. This wasn't coincidence. The Chinese internet sector was largely private and meritocratic from the beginning, rewarding technical competence in ways that other sectors didn't. The chip crisis wake-up call. Fast forward to 2018, and China's STEM obsession took on new urgency. 
When the U.S. government banned American companies from selling semiconductors to ZTE, the Chinese telecom giant nearly collapsed overnight. The incident was a national wake-up call. Despite having millions of engineers, China still depended on foreign technology for critical components. The response was swift and dramatic. Microelectronics programs saw surging enrollment, with students expressing willingness to take lower salaries to work in chip design. The message was clear. Technical self-reliance wasn't just an economic goal, it was a matter of national security. The AI arms race. Today, China's AI sector has created unprecedented demand for technical talent. AI engineers earn average salaries of $60,000, significantly higher than liberal arts graduates and well above the national average. Companies like ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, and Alibaba compete intensively for top technical talent, driving up both compensation and social prestige for STEM fields. Huawei's Genius Youth program offers salaries up to $200,000 for exceptional PhD graduates. The cycle that began 150 years ago with science for national salvation has evolved into something like AI for global competition. The unintended consequences. But there's a plot twist in this success story. Surveys now show that 38% of Chinese STEM students chose their majors primarily due to parental pressure, while 45% lack genuine interest in their fields. Some Chinese AI companies report that their technical staff, while excellent at programming, struggle with tasks like writing documentation or communicating with users. The early separation of students into science and liberal arts tracks may be creating specialists who are brilliant but narrow. Qian Shuesen, the rocket scientist who helped launch China's space program, posed a famous question in his later years. Why can't Chinese schools produce outstanding innovative talent? His answer was that innovation requires combining scientific knowledge with artistic sensibility and humanistic understanding. It's a reminder that the same cultural forces that created China's STEM army might also be limiting its potential. Standing in that Silicon Valley coffee shop today, you might overhear a different conversation. Chinese companies are starting to experiment with liberal arts education and interdisciplinary programs. Some are hiring philosophers to think about AI ethics and anthropologists to understand user behavior. The country that spent 150 years transforming itself into an engineering powerhouse is now grappling with a new question. How do you maintain technical excellence while also cultivating the creativity and cultural understanding necessary for true innovation leadership? It's a challenge that other nations trying to build technical capacity should watch carefully. China's STEM success story is remarkable, but it's also a reminder that human talent is multifaceted. The next phase of global competition may well depend on who figures out how to combine technical brilliance with broader intellectual and cultural capabilities. And that's a race where the rules are still being written. The engineer shortage that worries Silicon Valley venture capitalists? It's real. But the solution might not be simply producing more engineers. It might be producing better, more well-rounded ones.